Okay, so welcome everybody to this second keynote lecture at the summer school at Potsdam. We are very lucky to have Philip Aldai uh, giving a talk today on the analysis of variance, or maybe not doing the analysis of variance. I guess. <laughs> He's a senior neuroscientist at uh, Beacon Biosignals in the United States. And so he was in academia earlier in, um, in the Max Planck, Max Planck Institute in Nijmegen. And uh, now he does a variety of things relating to Julia, it seems, uh, at Beacon Biosignals. And so take it away, Philip. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, so when Siobhan asked me to present this um, a while back, <laughs> I told him that I want to be controversial. So, um, and the motivation for this was something I find really problematic, an attitude that a senior scientist expressed in the US um, that I don't think is uncommon. And mainly that doing statistics should be like going to the bathroom. You have to do it, uh, you want to do it right, but you don't make a big deal and you don't talk about it. And um, we've had a pandemic the last year. I'm not sure if everybody's noticed this. And so <laughs> personal hygiene and the hygiene of other people in our society, it turns out matters a lot. Um, this is something we've known for a long time. Um, in English, we have the expression typhoid Mary. Um, so this is, this is perhaps a more apt metaphor than, than was realized. Um, but um, I saw this on the internet and my first thought was this classic internet thought, you know, hold my beer, somebody is wrong on the internet. I have to go take care of this right now. I will not sleep until I am vindicated. Um, luckily I am not on Twitter. And so I was not tempted to post things too quickly. Um, that's why I'm not on Twitter. Um, so this is kind of the background thought that's going into this, is this attitude that you know, statistics gets in the way of science. Um, and I hope to kind of assuage that fear a bit. So before I talk, Siobhan did a pretty good job in introducing me. I'll say a few more words about myself um, because um, to understand my perspective, you also have to have a better idea of who I am. And also when I talk about things that I think are easier, things that I think are hard, it helps to know like, like where I'm coming from. So um, I, <laughs> I do admit to having studied math uh, as an undergraduate, but also German. I did not study statistics. At that point in my life, I thought statistics was black magic and it was the dark side of the force and should be thoroughly avoided. Um, I've actually never had any formal statistical edu uh, education or training. Um, I thought people in math were weird. And then I left math and did a master's on language change, looking at regular and irregular inflection, inflection in particular verb, verbal inflection and continental West Germanic. And then I did a doctorate in psycholinguistics with a focus on EEG and designs that just aren't possible under the ANOVA framework. So things like natural stimuli, uh, adaptive experiments and computational modeling. I then did postdocs uh, at the University of South Australia in quantum neuroscience and in the Netherlands, as Sherlock mentioned, uh, in psycholinguistics. I'm now a neuroscientist in the private sector. We're working on improving neurology. Um, and um, something that my family has long told me and that my colleagues at my current job tell me is that I like to poke the bear um, and that I'm a well-meaning troll. So I'm past I've given talks of the form, who's got a P um, about P values um, and ban the T test. I'm also a white cis hetero male working in biotech. So I come from a position of a lot of privilege. I try to be aware of this, um, but it's, it's something that I like to say up front so that I also think about it. Um, and you know, these are my opinions. They're not the opinions of anybody else. <laughs> they should not be taken as that. Other people may share these opinions. I do not claim so. So let's talk about the past. Um, so our old friend, the T-test. Um, so William Sidley Gossett published the, the paper that developed what is now known as the T-test in 1908 under the pseudonym student. Now he published under the pseudonym student because he was working for Guinness and Guinness didn't want the world to know that they were working on this type of technique because it might've been useful to other people. Um, and uh, the reason why they're interested in this is because collecting less data means faster testing. This is important. They're using it for quality control. Um, fewer numbers are easier to deal with when you don't have computers. Um, you can't sell what you drink if you're making beer and being drunk at work is generally frowned upon. So this is where small sample statistics came from. Um, and where this t-test comes from. Um, now, notably, student at the time actually did not describe this as a statistical test. His paper is titled on the probable error of the mean. He was looking at estimating these things, not testing per se. Um, but the way that most of us are introduced to this is as a t-test, 
and then we see a T value, and then we see a P value. And then depending on how the P value goes, we have a great day or a bad day. Um, so it's important to review how P values are actually computed um, or what they, where they actually come from. So under the null hypothesis, and that is sweeping a lot under the rug, but let's go with it for now. Um, test statistics have a known distribution. Now, test statistics are all those letter values you might have seen in your intro stats courses. So the Z values, the T values, F values, uh, chi squared, all these things. So those are test statistics. They might have an analytic distribution where these things are known from first principles and based on asymptotic assumptions, or they might be empirically determined. So bootstrapping and other resampling methods. So we have a distribution, a reference distribution. Uh, we compute our test statistic. And um, real quick, uh, if you don't remember this, um, most of our basic test statistics are really basic. Um, so the t-test is just the mean divided by the standard error. So it's just this notion of how good is my estimate compared to my, my, my error. The f-test is a comparison of the ratio of variances. And the degrees of freedom in these tests just compensate for small samples, right? Um, and then you compute the test statistic, you have the degrees of freedom, and you compare it to the reference distribution. The old way was use a table and find out what your p-value is less than. That's why older papers have p-values of the form like p less than 0.1, p less than 0.4. Um, notice no O there, um, because um, you had to look it up in a table. Um, and tables didn't list every single possible p-value. Um, the new way is to have the computer figure out a, a pretty precise value. Now, what's really interesting here is that we think of this t-test in terms of p-values already. Um, and this has been classically a problem uh, that Doug Bates has talked about, that uh, the, the T statistics in LME4, by default, don't present uh, p-values. And I think this is okay. Um, I'm a big fan. But uh, part of it is students' paper on this probable error of the mean came out 20 years before Fisher and the rest of the, the, the old white men developed the, the notion of statistical significance. And so we've confounded these ideas, but they're really quite separate. So students' actual contribution, William Goss's contribution, was consider situations where the sample isn't so large that it behaves just like a population. Propose a small samples method for estimating the uncertainty. He found the reference distribution for t-values under a certain set of assumptions. This is the null hypothesis. And he did all of this based on intuition simulation. Um, student didn't have the computers we had today for obvious reasons. He also wasn't particularly good at math. Um, he just kind of went home and just churned away until he got it right. He worked really hard. Um, now, I wanna have a technical footnote here. Um, I know there's at least one real statistician in the audience, so I'm very aware, but I'm simplifying things here. Um, but let's, let's try to find a middle ground. So these reference distributions I've been talking about are sampling distributions, which are the distributions we would see for a particular value when estimating that value from the repeated sampling of a population. All the components of a t-value have their own sampling distribution. So the estimate has a sampling distribution, the error has a sampling distribution, and you can do sampling distributions all the way down. It's just turtles all the way down. Um, what Gossett actually did is he figured out the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean, um, which is also known as the standard error, and that's why the title of this work was On the Probable Error of the Mean. Um, he showed that the sampling distribution of the standard error was dependent on sample size. Later, this was corrected with Fisher's help to be called uh, degrees of freedom. He then posited a distribution for that ratio of the estimate to the error, i.e. for the t-value. And he did, again, all of this 20 years before statistical significance existed. So we, we got started without significance. Um, and somewhere we got it in. Um, I'm going to skip this relatively quickly, but I want to point out uh, that even the basic things that we talk about, like this basic classical statistics, the t-test is kind of very foundational idea. We often don't do a good job explaining it and thinking about it. There is only one t-test. So if you remember from your intro stats courses, you probably saw there's a pair t-test and there's two sample t-tests and there's a one sample t-test and there's Walsh's t-test and all these things. They're actually all the same thing under the hood. They're just a couple little things done to make them spiffy. Um, so a rather significant step in, in the history of science was moving from estimated error to stargazing. So looking for these little asterisks and the table summaries. So looking for the cases where something was in the statistical sense, significant. Now, a lot of very smart people have harped on the problems of statistical significance and the problems of null hypothesis significance testing and all of these things. I unfortunately cannot talk about the past, present, and future statistics without also doing this a bit, but I recommend that you go look at their stuff. There's a lot better discussions than I'll be able to do as part of a larger discussion. So the thing to remember about these early efforts was that statistical testing was developed for small samples with big effects. So basic quality control, 
And then things like farming techniques and fertilizer. So these classical analysis of various designs like the split plot design, or because the plot in question is a field on a farm that they literally like divide in half and then plot uh, things and use different fertilizers, for example. And you had to be careful to split a single plot so that you didn't attribute something to the treatment when it was because that field is better than the other field. Um, these are all things extending the large sample statistics that have been developed for biometrics. And unfortunately, anytime you talk about biometrics, somebody gets the wild idea of doing eugenics. Um, this is historically very problematic. Um, and old white dudes in the 19th and early 20th century were particularly bad about this. I'm very sorry. Um, but uh, these small sample sizes were viewed skeptically even back then. So Carl Pearson of Pearson's uh, correlation statistic fame and various other things uh, actually wrote to students, wrote, wrote to Lynn Gossett and said, you know, this worry about the degrees of freedom, right? Only naughty brewers take in so small that the difference is not in the order of the probable error. In other words, if you have to correct for your sample size, you're probably doing it wrong, um, which is a very different perspective from today. Um, so let's take a step forward. Let's, 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 that's statistics 100 years ago. We live in a modern age. Um, let's talk about the present-ish. So let's meet Sam, the psych grad student. Uh, Sam is a rubber duck and is very interested in, in, in doing things right. Um, it looks like they are coding, coding in Java, for which I apologize, but um, Sam um, starts a study. And Sam has learned that it's important to be empirical. Sam collects data, computes the means. The means differ. Now, Sam has heard that sometimes differences aren't meaningful. So Sam's supervisor says, compute some statistics and find out if the differences are significant. That's a nice sounding word. So depending on what experiment Sam did, there's kind of a couple of different trajectories that could go. One is that Sam finds something that is super significant. So in this case, P equals 0 0.0003. And Sam is delighted, he gets the asterisk and he gets a paper and it's a great day. Now, if you look at this distribution, you can see that th th there's not a meaningful difference here, right? And more importantly, if you were trying to describe this and you said, okay, so based on my manipulation, I'm gonna guess that the reaction time is you know, 50 milliseconds slower. Okay, that's interesting. What's the variability in an individual's reaction time? Oh, that's a lot bigger. So does knowing that there's this difference between these distributions help me? Hmm? Not until you can start to think about all the other variability that's there. But, you know, let's say Sam the second gets a different thing. Now, in this case, the true effect size is quite large, but Sam gets unlucky. Um, and uh, with only 20 test subjects, um, the probability of getting unlucky is unfortunately not as, not as low as Sam would like, but Sam doesn't know this. And so these are the two samples Sam gets, and this is not significant. Uh, there's no papers published, and it's a very sad evening for Sam. But another case is um, there is a substantial difference, but there's also a really like a qualitative visual difference in the two samples Sam draws. Now, um, the difference in the means between these two distributions is one, they have very different variances, um, and this difference is not significant. Now, I know the true values here because I simulated this data, uh, in reality, you won't, but I mean, that's, that's part of the problem. Um, and so this test comes back as not significant. But more interestingly is that this was a test for difference of means. If you look at these two distributions, I don't know if the difference in means is actually the interesting bit. It might be the case that the difference in variance is actually much more interesting. Um, and uh, Rand Wilcox has been harping about this actually for many decades. Uh, for example, between many clinical populations, the difference is not so much in the means, but in the variances. So Sam, having completed the virtual statistics, is now so very certain, certain about uncertainty. And this is a learned behavior. Um, so we don't enter the empirical sciences saying, today I'm gonna compute an ANOVA. Um, typically, um, we, we do this um, later. And so this, this is quite a surprise. Um, and so Sam understands that this uncertainty and randomness are things that can fool the scientist, 
Um, Sam understands that you decide whether you have enough certainty by performing this sacred ritual of hypothesis testing and looking at the stars, looking at the asterisks in the significance table. And Sam thinks some smart person has figured this all out, and so Sam doesn't have to bother really understanding it. After all, it's Sam the scientist and not Sam the statistician. But what are all these rituals actually doing? So somewhere they encode a model of the data and uncertainty. But where did this model go? Where did the uncertainty go? Where did all the other characteristics go besides the mean? And where did the fun go, right? Like, why, why should this presence of this little asterisk in a table not decide whether or not this is good stuff? Um, so part of it is that this has become a form of what Feynman called cargo cult science. Uh, Feynman was an American physicist uh, in the 20th century, um, did a lot of public outreach, um, also worked on the Manhattan Project, um, and ultimately won the Nobel Prize for uh, uh, work in quantum mechanics. But um, he described this notion of the cargo cult. Um, I am not 100% sure that this, that this story is not apoc apocryphal, but it's, it's a nice metaphor nonetheless. So in the South Seas, there's a cargo cult of people. During the Second World War, they saw airplanes land, lots of good materials. And so now they want, the war is over, they want this to keep happening. And so they have built things that look like runways. They've put fires alongside the runways like they had in the Second World War. Uh, they've added a wooden hut to, for somebody to sit in, so like the, the air traffic control tower. They put somebody out there with the little radio antennas on their helmet. Um, and they've done all the rituals. They've created this really great fac uh, facsimile of what it looked like during the Second War. They're doing everything right but the planes don't land and the results don't come. Now, what's going wrong here? And the thing is, from an outside perspective, we say, well, there's, there's, there's more depth to it. They don't, they don't have a correct model of what's going on. They don't understand what's going on. And I feel like this is kind of what we're doing a lot uh, in, in psychological science is the planes landed in the good old ANOVA times, but the old gestures don't work and the new gestures like keep it maximal don't really either. Um, we're having trouble. <laughs> So um, this kind of brings me to my next point. What has actually changed in the last 10 to 20 years? Well, computers became fast and more readily available. Um, the, the mobile phone that I'm using to keep track of time during this presentation is actually more powerful than the computer I wrote my master's thesis on. Um, software for a lot of the methods we use became freely available and comparatively usable. Um, following the availability of this computational infrastructure, the expectation arose that we actually use it. And so what we have done is we've gained access to powerful tools that Clark and Cohen could have only dreamt of. So uh, Clark of this Clark 1973 fame for uh, language to fix effect fallacy and Jacob Cohen who did um, a lot of work on power analysis in the 60s. Um, but now we're complaining that it takes too much skill to operate the power tools. And so therefore we should go back to whittling with our pocket knives. And that's not great. And somehow we've become even more attached to these rituals. Like we, we really have codified them in a way that they weren't even codified 50 years ago. Um, so this, this, is, this is kind of shocking, right? Um, another thing that has really come out in the last uh, 20 years, um, so really in the span of my own education uh, at the university level and beyond is uh, meta science and replication crisis. What we've discovered is that we really poorly understood and practiced experimental design and control. We've done things like multiple comparisons, optional stopping, circular analysis, all sorts of research degrees of freedom. We've discovered that, or some of us haven't discovered, unfortunately, that if you have a low power situation, that having your effects survive low power is not a good thing because it means that you probably got the magnitude and direction wrong. Um, and we've also actually been really bad at general reporting. Even if we were happy and content to stay in an ANOVA world, uh, are we reporting whether we're using type one, type two, or type three sums of squares? Do you know what the difference is? Um, if you want to argue that you're staying in ANOVA and you can't explain the difference between these three things and what it means for your inference, that's a problem. So um, I don't want to pick on the career too much, but uh, he made the mistake of speaking out on a public platform and articulating thoughts other people have had. Um, so one of the, the comments here is uh, most of the advances since Clark 1973 haven't done much. 
Um, and so I want to look at what existed in 1973. And before Clark published, we had Bayesian statistics going all the way back to the beginning of the 19th century um, and all sorts of notions of probability covering 200 years. We had stochastic and MCMC methods. Um, so Metropolis and Ulam developed a mechanical device for doing MCMC uh, in 1949. We had estimation instead of significance. So what we call the new statistics is actually the oldest statistics. So Gauss and Lagrange, uh, Lagrange had developed this around 1800. Pearson and Gossett around 1900 again. And then uh, Jersey Nyman developed the notion of conf what we now call confidence, confidence intervals around 1937. Things like shrinkage and regularization um, were developed in the 40s and 50s. Even mixed models have existed in some form as an idea that we have since Fisher. 1918, he writes about using random effects models, what we now call mixed models. And Henderson writes about this in 1950. Uh, using logistic regression, for example, if you have a binomial response, so for accuracy data, um, has been around since the 40s and 50s. Um, even Clark himself wasn't the first person to point out the language as a fixed effect fallacy. Indeed, in the opening paragraph <coughs> of his 1973 paper, Clark complains that nobody's been paying attention to Coleman, uh, who wrote in 1964. Um, power analysis and effect sizes, well, Cohen's ranted about this starting in the 60s and kept going up until his death in the 90s. And he wrote rather pithily um, in the early 90s, a paper called The World is Round, P less than 0 0.05. And one of the great things that he also discusses in that in another paper um, called Things I've Learned So Far, is that he suspects the reason we don't show confidence intervals in psychology is because we'd be embarrassed by how broad they are. Um, things like Simpson's paradox, Mule's paradox, which actually really points out that uh, hypothesis testing is, in the classical formulation, really bad. Um, in fact, as your theories get more precise, the worse hypothesis testing gets for developing and manipulating those theories that you should really use confidence intervals. Things like cross-validations or early attempts at uh, robust statistics. This was all before Clark's paper. Now, we can also go to this slightly differently and say, okay, what happened after Clark? Well, I wanna say, okay, what happened after Clark, but before I was born? Because anything that happened before I was born, I can't claim to be truly new. Um, that's not gonna reveal my, my age, but uh, that's the price you pay. Um, so the notion of the general linear model for practitioners was discussed in the early 80s. GAMS also discovered in the early 80s. Um, this has most recently been taken up by work from um, uh, Harold Byron's group on uh, the language world. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, Mule's paradox has been really addressed by John Kruschke on the psychology side. Um, modern robust methods, uh, resampling methods, I've listed here because the bootstrap really is much better than the jackknife, and it's from 1979. And oddly enough, the box plot is not something we consider advanced or novel. And the publication that describes it is after Clark's paper. Um, so this, this kind of arbitrary line in the sand is not a good one. And so what I wanna get back to is that statistics is about data and uncertainty. This has always been hard and we've been messing it up from the beginning, even for things that feel like push button procedures like ANOVA. If you haven't been reporting sums of squares or doing planned post, uh, post hoc comparisons, all this, that's hard. Or for example, if you don't know what the actual null hypothesis is in a repeated measures ANOVA, um, then you don't know what the hypothesis is that you're rejecting, right? when you try to reject it. And I don't wanna get into what that is because it is a painful hypothesis to articulate, but it's not easy. Um, and the other part of this is sometimes soft science is the hardest science. Um, and I took this pun from a blog, but humans are complex entities with lots of hidden and unobservable state. We'll never achieve the type of experimental control that the physical sciences like physics and chemistry have. Um, but even those sciences use really advanced methods to handle their data, and they collect a lot of data. So the standard for significance in, for example, in fundamental physics and particle physics is five sigma. Now, imagine that the next time you have to get a significant p-value, you have to have p less than 0 0.6 zeros and then a one. That's the standard in physics. Um, another thing that makes our, our work hard is that we have to be experts at both traditional humanities and traditional science. And I put both these in air quotes because I'm not sure that it makes sense to divide these things up this way. But I think we should still aim to be a science, which means that we need to deal with data and uncertainty. Um, and we need to do this even though it's hard, or some of us want to do it because it's hard to, to channel John Kennedy's quote. Um, 
And so we also need to be quite explicit about the models we're using and think about where, very hard about whether these models are valid. And every statistical test that you have heard of has a model behind it. You just might not know it. Um, and going back to the power tools metaphor I mentioned previously, John Tukey has another great quote, which is the tool that is so dull that you cannot cut yourself on it is likely not, it's not likely to be sharp enough to be either useful or helpful. And this is where my problem with things like ANOVA come from, is that they're not useful in a good sense. They don't help us build better ideas of reality, is what I would argue. Because statistics and science are both about models. To paraphrase George Box, no theory is perfect, but only some are useful. Um, theories that don't take into account real world uncertainty and variability aren't going to be particularly useful. So for example, um, that plot I had with the, comparing the two, uh, the significant p-value, the one significant p-value, it made a claim about a difference, but it didn't take into account like the uncertainty that, that that was just swamped by everything else going on there. And using a default model, whether it's ANOVA or keep it maximal, it's like one size fits all clothing. And then never bother to actually check whether it fits. All right, so you're just like, oh, I'm gonna take that t-shirt off the rack. It's the first one I saw, surely it'll fit. Maybe. So Karo cult statistics, this statistics is the science of defaults as Andrew Gelman says, is still a Karo cult science. And that's not good science. And so this idea that, well, we're trying harder, we're, we're trying to get our models to converge in all this. Well, not really. The, the trying harder bit happens before data collection. Um, and this is, this is one of those things that I am not the first person to say this, people are talking about this, this notion of even basic things like uh, checking statistical power. So uh, Catherine Button has a great example of this stuff in neuroscience and all this um, about whether or not you have this stuff, it starts there. And so you have to try harder all the way. So this brings us up kind of specific complaint um, is about mixed models, which uh, have been on my mind because I've been teaching them this week, um, is this idea that uh, we're now running two by two experiments with hundreds of subjects um, because otherwise we can't get the models to converge and we're testing for effects we don't care about and things like this. Well, on the one hand, Cohen warned you about this in the 60s, um, that most psychological studies are not sufficiently powered. Um, and I haven't seen power analysis on, on these claims. The other one is um, that uh, power is a function of both effect size and sample size, right? So if you're trying to measure a very small effect, you do need a very large sample. But if you can assume that your effect is practically equivalent to zero, so it falls in this region of, of practical equivalence, um, then you don't need to power your study to detect it. Um, or you also make statements about this. Um, and this kind of also gets this whole notion of whether your power is sufficient, things like this. The combination of some data and aching desire for an answer does not ensure that a reasonable answer can be extracted from a given body of data. And this is what I mean by thinking harder up front. This is, this is kind of going to be a recurring theme, is if you think harder up front, you can avoid a lot of these other things. And the thing is, you have to think along with your data. You have to deal with the uncertainty. Um, and I want to address this concern in particular rather quickly in just a minute. Um, but uh, the, you can also think of what I'm saying is measure twice, cut once. This is an aphorism in English. And so your analysis plan is part of your experimental plan. Um, you should use simulation to think about and reason about your data and analysis before collecting real data. Um, in the Bayesian world, this has also been done under the, the guise of uh, prior predictive uh, simulation, your prior predictive distribution. This is the same idea, that you're looking at what your theory, what your ideas going into the experiment are saying. You conduct a pilot study to get an idea about real-world error. For example, I come from EEG, so you might discover that, oh, wow, um, participants blink a lot in this experiment. We weren't expecting that, so we have really heavy trial loss. Um, what do we do about it? Um, and then you kind of iterate. You rinse, log, and repeat and you don't depend on defaults. And I want to uh, try to quickly show a simulation example of this. Um, I will make all the code for this publicly available after this talk, um, so that you are free to go play with it yourself. Um, this is all done in Julia. I'm going to be doing the majority of this in real time. Um, let me see if I can see this. So, um, Trevon, can you nod if you can see the new simulation thing? No? Okay, let me try to share again. Oh, 
Okay, now, super. Okay, so the way I rephrase this for the simulation work is kind of two parts. One is to state your budget, which is time and money, right? Um, you can think of that as, you know, number of participants, and number of items that you have time to collect, or even the funds and resources to collect. That is part of your budget. And then you state your theory. Um, and so doing this kind of simulation work ahead of time is making a statement about your theory, about your hypotheses. Um, Olivia Guest has done this nicely, is modeling those living ideas that run in your head, also run on other computers. Um, and I really like this. So what I have done here is I'm simulating a two by two design. Um, and I am specifying here um, something that I know is the ground truth. So in this design, the ground truth is that there, the ground truth is the maximal model. Now, typically we don't know this, but I'm going to assume that this is the case. Um, and 20 participants, 20 items. I have filled in uh, random effects for everything. Uh, and then the estimated effect sizes. And in this study, I have two models that I fit. One is the maximal model, which is the true model in this case. And one is a reduced model. Now, the point that was often been harped with this, this keep it maximal advice is that if you look for this interaction term where I've left out the corresponding uh, random effects, um, it is significant in the reduced model, but it's not in the, um, in the full model. Well, okay. Um, so for this data set, that's, that's not what you wanna do. But what happens if we increase the number of participants? So this is the easiest case. Um, oops. If we increase the number of participants and we're sufficiently powered, the study is okay. Now, the other thing I want to note, sorry, I should have done this before I increase the number of participants, but if we start off with 20 participants anyway, and 20 items, the thing to note is I specified the true value of this effect size to be um, 0.6. And here, the model, even the maximal model, is failing to recover that. And so this is an important thing, is this is an underpowered study. I'm not recovering the parameter values. Um, and so I'm, I'm failing to recover this parameter value, even ignoring the standard errors and all this, um, because I don't have the statistical power to do so. Um, and if you look at this and you say, okay, well then it shouldn't be significant. Okay, fair. But also you can plan to have the sufficient power to do this based on that assumption. Um, but the interesting thing is the point estimates here are the same. And this is the key. The, the secret here is that if you really want to get a handle on your variability and whether your effect is real, replicate. Um, so the point estimates are the same. It's not impacted by this. And so if you replicate and check out the variability and the replications based on this, you'll actually get a better idea. Now, you can also view increasing your sample size here as um, a form of replication. So let's do that again. Um, and in that case, we do recover the original primer value and both are significant. Everything's fine. We're sufficiently powered. Um, now, I've also entered here what I consider unreasonable effect sizes based on my knowledge of the literature and things like this. I have said that this top level interaction in the random effects has a huge effect size. If you actually look at real data where this has been estimated, this is typically much smaller. And so let's make it much smaller. And let's go back down to uh, 20 participants. Um, and you can see this fits in just a few seconds. Um, you see that if you take reasonable things into account, these answers get more and more similar. And so the bottom line here is, if you have a huge uh, random effect, so uh, between subjects variance on that component, that's an effect you should probably estimate. But if you're assuming that effect is small, so in other words, practically equivalent to zero and therefore an effect you don't care about, you can omit it without much penalty. Um, I want to point out something else here, and that's um, uh, Matashik and colleagues have shown this as have Bates and all about this kind of notion of parsimonious mixed models and balanced type one error and power. And uh, one of the plots that we've, we've developed recently is these shrinkage plots. And so what you actually see happening in these plots is that for this interaction term, 
um, the model is saying, I actually don't have enough power to really estimate and is collapsing it and eliminating it anyway. It's saying from the model perspective, it's practically zero. Now that's simulated data. Let's look at some real data. So uh, Crow, Miller and Barr have a study that's a two by two by two reaction time design that they published in 2007. And they made the data publicly available. It's good practice. I'm really happy about that. Um, they recommend, so Dale Barr recommends following uh, having this keep it maximal thing. Um, so let's fit a maximal model. So um, we can do this in Julia. So I'm just gonna take this moment to advertise what we can do in Julia. Um, you can see, I'm not sure if this will show up across Zoom, but this presentation format I'm using actually has the timings for each step in the presentation. And you can see that it took 7.3 seconds to fit this model. Um, so we can fit big models and we can fit them fast. Um, and so if you look at this maximal model, um, it fits, we can do it. But I'm gonna show you a little bit of a video about what this actually looks like and why these models take so long to fit. And the thing is, is this minus two log likelihood is a measure of how bad the fit is. So you want this to be smaller. Um, and the theta are the different parameter values in the model, the model uses to fit. Now, when you start off fitting, you see things bouncing around, you see much, not much change, it takes a little while, and it takes a long time before we start to see something. Um, and this is just the software doing its job, it's checking to see what the shape of the layout is of the land, and then suddenly, it kind of collapses, there's a sudden change. And then, if you look here in the bottom plot, you can see that this sudden collapse happens at the same time that many of the parameter values are estimated to be zero. These are all the interaction terms uh, and the random effect structure. They're all being squeezed to zero and it improves the model fit. Um, and so this is telling you is that for all intents and purposes, these are indistinguishable from the residual variance from or the variation induced by the residual variability. And so why would you put them in your model? Now, the other thing that you'll notice is that um, this keeps running and running and running. And even, uh, so this is not being done in real time, I've all computed this ahead of time, but this would take a while, like an LME4, um, because you have all this work to do it. And the reason why it takes so long, and if you look, after all that effort, the conclusion is that most of the parameters are zero. There's only about one, two, three, four that are not zero, and that has the best fit. Now, you can view this a different way, which is you can view it as kind of exploring this parameter space. And for time reasons, I'm gonna skip ahead. And what the optimizer is doing in all these cases, and this is where knowing ahead of time helps you, is it's just tweaking these tiny values saying, are you really zero or are you 0 0.001? And if you notice, this is just iterating and you can barely see these little dots bouncing around and the deviance, the, the minus two log likelihood is not changing. And this is the important thing is that these things are practically equivalent to zero. And even the model is telling you that. Um, now for reference, if you fit a reduced model, as I pointed out, there's um, only about four components that are not equal to zero. So that's uh, two random intercepts, a random slope, and the correlation between the intercept and the slope. You get a model, a much reduced model that fits much faster, in this case, in less than a second, that is indistinguishable in terms of fit. And um, you can also see on this video why. So why this is a better model, even practically, is because um, it converges so much faster. And notice that of the components that are remaining, none of them are being forced to zero. And this is a really important thing. We only have as much complexity as necessary. And this is also tying into the kind of the comment that you should think about your data ahead of time. And you should simulate your data. Don't trust a simulation of somebody else's data done under different assumptions. Simulate your data under the assumptions you're making about your experiment and think ahead of time and then make the decision about what's appropriate for your data. So uh, I have about 10 minutes left, I think. Um, as I said, the simulation stuff is a lot, it's a lot of material um, and I plowed through it very quickly. So I have time for the future, which I also promise as part of this talk. Um, I will say one final thing on the simulation stuff uh, besides the fact that it'll, it'll be all publicly available online. Um, I did promise in my abstract to mention why modern methods are great. And one of the things is, is a lot of studies that discuss um, uh, uh, language and all this, or there's this thing about individual differences as a special thing. And the thing is, if you do mixed models instead of ANOVA, 
um, you get for free the individual differences. So these are um, the differences by participant in this case, how much each participant differs from the population level effect. Um, and so this is something you get for free by using modern tools. And so every study can look at both population and uh, inter-individual level effects. Um, you don't need to have these things be separate. You can <coughs> have both all the time. So, um, Siobhan, can you see the slides now? It says the future. Okay, good. Um, so, the future is now. Um, what can we do? I've complained a lot about things that are broken. I've showed some cool things that I think will help us fix things. But I think um, we also need to think in really practical terms. We need to start earlier and work continuously. And I mean this in the sense of our education. Um, the fact that uh, all these things are hard to use or that people don't understand them or they're expected to use tools that are more complicated than they know how to use um, reflects upon um, the senior people and the methods people as well. So this, this is a statement about us and things that we have not done as well as we, we would like. Um, now, of course, we're assuming that uh, everybody wants to learn um, and everybody wants to try, but I, I can't convince you to try, I don't know. But, um, but start if you start early and you work continuously, then it's a lot easier. So this week at the summer school, we've accomplished a lot. Uh, it's been really impressive to watch the students uh, uh, improve so quickly, but it's a week. And I'm trying to dump 15 years of my knowledge of mixed models into students' heads in a week. That's a lot. <laughs> and so I think the better thing is to start early and just build continuously. And from the very beginning, discuss ideas of modeling and stuff like this and build up so that you can see how it all fits together and not make it some ritual that's done as an appendix to the, to the, to the graduate education, but make it the whole way. The other thing is, is if you start early and work continuously, is you have time to address uh, more fundamental issues. So for better or worse, a lot of people coming from uh, language and psychology backgrounds don't have as much math and it's a fact of life, it's fine. But what we can do is we can work on filling in those gaps as necessary so that they can do the type of experimental work that they're interested in. And I think that's really important. And that only happens if we start early and work continuously. The other thing is uh, collaborate, team science, right? Um, I don't think this is a novel idea at all, but this is super important that we work together um, and that we recognize not everybody is an expert in everything. In fact, nobody can be an expert in everything, even within linguistics. Nobody is an expert in everything. Um, like <laughs> any of these fields that we call the cognitive sciences or neuroscience or psychology or language science, any of these things, each one of those is this huge, huge area and nobody's an expert in all of it. I don't expect everybody to be an expert in all these things, but the important thing is that we collaborate, we find meaningful collaborations, and we learn enough to communicate. I think this is the other thing, is that learning enough to communicate is very important. Uh, my career has worked out quite well for me in some sense because I learned enough to communicate with both the stats people and the signal processing people and with the language people. And so that was really my thing. It's not that I am a statistical whiz kid. It's that I learned enough to ask questions and try to understand the answers I got back. And I think this is an important thing. It's just learning how to talk. And one of the hard things in statistics and actually in all of mathematics is that everyday words are used with very specific technical meanings and we do not emphasize this enough. The most obvious one are things like, the most obvious one is significance. That significance is a technical concept and it does not mean relevance um, or even of interest. Um, the other thing is, so other things we can do, we can value knowledge over publications. Um, and I realize this is somewhat anathema to the modern scientific practice, um, but this is quite important. Um, one of my great frustrations uh, as a reviewer, as a scientist, is reading papers where I look at it and I say, no, <laughs> like th there, there's nothing meaningful going on here. Um, and the trick is that we need to value knowledge of publications. That also means, in other words, contribute more to the signal than we are to the noise. Um, and I mean this in a, in a very concrete sense as well, that if we do underpowered studies and try to publish them because we got that magical asterisk, um, we're actually contributing to the noise, right? We're not helping people accomplish things. Um, on that note, we should also value estimates over asterisks. So really think about what are we estimating and what that means, what that would mean in practical terms. This is not an argument for doing only large effects. This is an argument for understanding how your effect fits in with the variability that you have in your data. Um, and then learn principles first, then software. I think a, a really hard thing that people talk about is learning the software, for example, um, learning a whole new programming language to take advantage of mixed models such AL is, is a big ask, right? 
but a lot of the problems that we encounter with, with, with uh, people trying to learn uh, things are not particular to Julia, there are more fundamental problems in their understanding of how these things work. And so it helps if we start to think about learning principles and then learning how they do them in software. Uh, and by principles, I mean just kind of broad things. And I don't expect everybody to be able to write down like the, the hat matrix and things like this, but learning what regression actually means, for example, um, learning that it minimizes uh, the squared error in the vertical direction in the y-axis, but not in the x direction. Um, learning about the general model, the general linear model, and learning about contrast coding. Uh, Laurel Brim and I have a manuscript currently under review where we looked at the psycholinguistic literature and found that only 30% of papers reported contrast coding. We didn't look at whether they interpreted it correctly, but we, only 30% of papers reported it. And this is a major problem because you can't interpret the results at all without knowing the contrast coding scheme. Uh, Daniel Shad um, and a number of others, uh, I think, uh, with some support from Siobhan as well, uh, have a great paper on contrast and things like this. Um, but another thing is, why these squares, right? So if it, depending on how your stats education was done, you probably thought there's lots of least squares. There's like residual sum of squares, there's mean sum of squares, there's total sums of squares, and all these things. Why? Um, I don't have time today to tell you why, but uh, getting into that. Um, things like, what is maximum likely estimation actually doing? Maximum likelihood estimation. Um, if you understand what that is actually saying and what that statement makes, that helps. I'm not saying you have to use it, but understanding the types of statements you can make with it. Understanding approximations, what it means to approximate and versus exact methods. Uh, for Bayesians, this is quite relevant. The difference between exact methods to approximate problems and approximate solutions to exact problems. So the exact methods to approximate problems is, for example, a variational inference and approximate solutions to exact problems is something like MCMC. Uh, the difference between direct and iterative methods, for example, understanding what convergence means. Um, Bayes theorem, it's not just for Bayesians. Uh, the, the, the weird things that you get with conditional versus marginal probability. I think this is actually a public health issue because uh, understanding that, uh, for example, being like in an area where the majority of people are vaccinated against COVID-19, um, that a, they will see a lot of vaccinated people with COVID-19, um, like understanding that you're still at a lower risk uh, if you're vaccinated and if you're unvaccinated, stuff like this, it's quite hard for the general public, but we're scientists, we can do better. Um, frequent distance Bayesian concepts of probability. And my kind of major harking point is what are models and why do we use them and what it means to live with uncertainty and really think about how we express our theories about the world because models and theories are intimately tied to each other. Um, on a more selfish note, um, I'm aware that there's a few senior scientists in the audience. Um, and I think senior scientists should encourage senior scientists to learn statistics, programming, and these things, things that are often called data science today. I'm not saying that every PhD student has to be an expert data scientist, but no stretch of the imagination. But learning these things can help. And the truth is, there are not enough jobs in academia, period. The majority of graduate students will not be able to find a job in academia. This is a fact worldwide. Um, these skills are highly paid, so programming and basics, is, even basic competency in these things are highly paid and valuable in the outside world. Um, so these skills will give your students and mentees better job prospects when they have to, or they decide to leave academia. Um, moreover, if you really are going to choose ignorance, um, it's best to have students who are not ignorant around, because um, statistical consultation at free market prices is not something academics can afford. And I think that's also important to know. But that also ties into another point, which is... Um, a lot of us are doing this because we believe in it, right? So this whole summer school, right? This, this is largely a volunteer effort and you can do these things. And so this kind of ties into another point to bring it back to the Twitter thread that it all started with. Um, there's this claim that you can't be good at statistics or you can't try to do statistics and be good at linguistics or psychology. And this whole summer school that uh, Siobhan has done a great job organizing the last few years really shows that this is a fallacy, that this, that this is a deeply fallacious claim so Siobhan himself is a great example of this. Juanjo Kliegel is another example of this um, and many others. And um, on a more personal note, so the, the scientists of my cohort, uh, so Christina Bergman, Laurel Brim, Olivia Guest, uh, these are people who are excellent scientists and are able to do better science, be better linguists and better cognitive scientists because they've taken the time to engage with the statistics and with the notion of uncertainty in their data. Um, and the other thing is that I kind of want to point out is that 
the world that we have is the world that we make as, as more uh, senior people. Um, and one of the kind of fallacies here is that uh, statisticians don't want to look at your data. And the thing is, statisticians love to look at data. Um, that's kind of their thing. Um, so one of the issues is this claim that statisticians don't want to help do a data analysis. That's also not true. And it's another example from this summer school of how false this is, is um, Doug Bates is here. You know, this, this premier statistician of, 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 uh, of, the, of the generation ahead of us, and is just doing this basically for free because they believe and they want to help people in all this. And on the mixed models front, it's hard, but also like um, the mixed models mailing list for R, the STAN uh, discourse forums and all this, these are all people contributing their expertise, which is all worth a lot of money for free because they believe in this stuff and they think it's good that other people can also do this. Um, so my advice is to always be a student. Um, and this is a bit of a play of words. William Gossett, student, was very concerned with error and uncertainty and not with significance. He noticed when the tools of the day were insufficient. He developed new tools instead of just blindly using the easiest existing tool. He did this despite, despite not being particularly good at math. He was not afraid to collaborate when he needed help. And to give you an idea, to, to humanize this, a student corresponded with Fisher, and he actually said, look, man, I know I'm annoying you. I'm like a little uh, hen that's clicking around and asking all these questions. Um, so this was something like this, this, this is something important to know is that this is actually the, the better, the best tradition of statistics to follow is this notion of being willing to ask for help, being willing to engage with people. And no, you may not be able to collaborate with everybody, but there are people who will help you and discuss these things if you are willing and able to learn. So my final comment is uh, on this is more or less is to embrace uncertainty. And I really want to turn this kind of thing back on its head. Um, I think part of the problem is that we want these certain unchanging rules from statistics, but statistics is the study of uncertainty and variability. So why would you expect a deterministic procedure from the field that's obsessed with that not being the case? That seems kind of paradoxical to me. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, special thanks to the organizers, of course. Uh, the Center for Exploring Research, Bielefeld is hosting me. You can see the chalkboard behind me. Um, they've done really fantastic uh, work hosting us. Um, Doug Bates, Christina Bergman, uh, Laurel Brim, Benedict, Francisca, Reinhold, and Yoon have all patiently endured very long discussions on statistics and the best way to teach stats with me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to my, uh, my, my doctoral supervisor from years and years ago, Ina, um, for embracing my methodological work and encouraging it. And finally, I want to uh, thank my former student, Alana Jones, who inspired this title. Um, years ago, uh, when she came to me as an undergraduate research student, she wanted to do a project and I told her, you will not do ANOVA with me. If you want to do ANOVA, you have to find a different supervisor. Um, and she did not come from a strong math background. Indeed, her project was on math anxiety. Um, and uh, she said, okay. And I said, I will help you do the stuff, but you know, you still have to interpret it. It's still your data, all this. And so she was just a great student. And at the end of the, the, the collaboration, she gave me a mug that said, I put the no in ANOVA. I wish I had it with me today, but unfortunately I uh, was not able to get it before evacuating for Hurricane Ida. But thank you very much for listening. Um, I think it's now time for questions. Thank you. That was great. So there are a couple of questions. Uh, can you see them or should I read them out to you? Uh, yes, I see a few questions. Okay. Yes. So the very first question, you know, is about, uh, uh, it says, is this in any way related to L1 and L2 regularization? This question was asked in the middle of your talk when you were showing right. those. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the shrinkage of mixed models and regularization, especially L2 regularization are very closely related. Um, that's a little bit off topic for here, but the other thing I mentioned was uh, Tinkinoff. Um, this is also the, the general formulation for regularization. Um, so the, the next question is, do we have to be concerned about type one error inflation? So let's go back to basics for a second. <laughs> so uh, type one and type two are, are kind of a trade-off, right? Ideally, you like you minimize, or you maximize type two power and minimize alpha error. So you minimize both types of error. That's a trade-off. And this is kind of the Matushek and colleagues paper published in the Journal of Memory and Language about how to manage this trade-off for mixed models. But the other thing is you don't actually know your type one error for real data as a rule, right? And so you have to figure that out. And that's what I meant about simulation is you make assumptions about what the real world looks like and you can estimate what you expect that error to be. 
And that's how you manage that. And for example, if you discover the effect that you care about or that a certain parameter of the model is very relevant and that you need a large sample size, I'm sorry, but that's the way the cookie crumbles, but you might discover that you don't need it. And that was also my statement. Um, so the next one is advice for graduate students on how to collaborate between students and the faculty. Um, it's usually the case that nobody in a linguistic cohort is good at computer simulation and modeling stuff. Um, this is a hard one, and it depends somewhat where you are. Um, so as I mentioned earlier on, I spent my life in four-ish academic, academic systems. Um, and the way that graduate students are herded or grouped in those, in those different systems is quite different. Um, and that makes a big difference. Um, I think the best thing you can do is, um, I, Twitter is a great place to get very angry. Twitter and the blog sphere, uh, it's a great place to get very angry. It's a great place to see strong opinions, whether right or wrong. Um, and that's a good starting point for reading and finding about other people. And then using that, not taking Twitter at its word, but using that to find other resources to read up on and figure out what is useful in all this. It's also a great way to find out what you're interested in. Um, so what types of research questions and all this. Um, and the other thing is um, a little bit harder in Corona times, but these kind of uh, interdisciplinary get togethers, if university has one, great. If it doesn't, um, maybe organize one. Um, and I would be amiss in not mentioning organizations like Our Ladies um, as great places to start for this. Uh, is marginal significance a thing? No. Um, so um, uh, significance, um, so part of the problem with significance testing is that our modern take on it is a merger of two incompatible philosophies, the pearson uh, Nyman philosophy and the Fisherian philosophy. Um, there's all sorts of things there, but the bottom line is, if you're going to play the significance game, you have to play by the rules. And the rules are you pick your threshold ahead of time, either you're below the threshold or you're not. Also, marginal has a different meaning in statistics and that's another problem, um, is yeah, that- If I can interrupt here, uh, there's uh, one thing that I always write in my reviews, I allow the authors to write marginally significant if they will write their significant effects as marginally non-significant. So if they're willing to do that, I'm, I say that it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Um, um, the next question is, what is the meaningful effect size? I don't know. I don't know what it is for your research question. Um, I uh, actually had a discussion with this shortly before this talk began. Um, the thing about effect sizes is the, the, the relevant effect size is the one that you care about. Um, but having chosen your research question and figured out what, you, what effect size you care about, that also tells you what you need to do to be able to measure it. And if you discover that you need to do things that you don't want to do to measure it, that's a bit of bad luck. Um, which is a quite controversial thing to say. But um, I think there is validity in, in studying small effects. There's validity in studying big effects. I also think that most of the big effects in the cognitive sciences um, are gone. Um, like we, we have picked all the low hanging fruit from the tree of knowledge and we have to move on. Um, and that's, that's rough for the new generation. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, Can I just add something to that? Yeah, I just please. wanted to briefly say that I mean, I also struggle with this problem that effect sizes are very small in eye tracking studies, also in ERP studies and so on. Uh, I think the way I would want to interpret those small effect sizes in the context of some computational model that makes some meaningful prediction about the phenomenon I'm studying, you know? Yep. So I, I want to, it can have meaning, but it has to have a meaning in a precise enough quantitatively, you know, interpretable way. If you just say that I expect an effect to be present, right? That is just too vague a statement to, you know, translate to an effect size. Yes, I think exactly. Be I, more, more focus on computational modeling is needed, I think. I, I completely agree. Um, I wrote as much many years ago that um, the, the reason why I'm a fan of computational modeling, not just simulation like I did for the statistics, but actual computational modeling, is it makes you write down your theories and hypotheses in a very precise way. Um, it makes you be brutally honest with yourself. Um, Olivia Guest has also written something similar in a recent paper. Um, and I think that's a very important thing to know. Um, now, the next thing is about evaluating data simulation when the ground truth values are unknown. Um, ha, that's hard. 
Um, so this is where the Bayesians will go, well, you should always have a prior because for example, um, and there's these things that they do with prior elicitation, right? So um, I come from EEG. So if somebody told me that, uh, you know, I don't have a prior on EEG, I said, well, do you think 10 microvolts is a reasonable effect size? And most people say, no. Do you think five is? Maybe. And this already tells you, you have some notion about what plausible values are. Um, and so you start from that and you go, okay, that tells me something. You say, okay, and what is the smallest one that I would care about? Again, how small you care about is your prerogative, um, but you pick that and then from that you can get at power. The other way you can do it is you can turn that problem around a bit and you can say, this is the budget I have for participants in testing. What is the smallest possible effect size I can reliably detect with that budget? Um, The roles of traditional, so the next one is the roles of traditional invasion statistics. Okay, so um, I mentioned I'm a troll. Um, so, but there's another even more masterful troll than I. Um, Michael Jordan, the statistician, not the basketball player, has a great talk that's available online. Um, if Siobhan reminds me afterwards, I'll find the link in Cinematome so you can post it, um, called Are You a Bayesian or a Frequentist? And he highlights that if you're doing stats right, the intermediate answers for Bayesian and Frequentism might not agree, but as the evidence accumulates, they will agree. And which one you prioritize depends on which one you need at the moment. Um, one of the things that I have really worked with and one of the things that I do in my, my current job is I deal with, at times, very, very large data sets. And uh, in those cases, I'm happy to use Frequentist methods because the likelihood is going to dominate. Um, and other times you might not have precise things. And then Bayesian. So I don't think that it's an either or. Um, and I use whatever one is the best tool for the question I want to look at. Um, I don't, sorry, that's not, that's not <laughs> the rules. It's whatever one is the best tool for the question you want to look at. Uh, so um, I just wanted to say that there are still a couple of questions left. Are you willing to go on beyond six yeah, o'clock? I, I, I have a cup of tea and a cup of water. I'm, Good to go. Then let's, then let's keep going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, ha. Okay. Balancing soup innovation, embracing good statistical with ritual based reviewers and supervisors. So, one of the things that I kind of brushed aside in my talk is that I said, you know, we need to pick how the future looks on this. Um, I was vague in the we. And this is something we have to decide as a community. Um, so, I think. So one thing I do is I, one, one of the things that I have worked very hard on is to publish methods papers so that I can point people and say, look, there's an extensive discussion of why this is a better method in other contexts. Um, I think for mixed models versus ANOVA, there are a non-trivial number of papers covering this. Um, but I think the other thing is to emphasize what you're trying to accomplish, right? So if you have a particular inferential goal, your statistical procedure should try to match that goal. And I think one of the things that you can do, oddly enough, is point out that ANOVA doesn't achieve this goal in many contexts um, and things like that. And so I think that's quite important. The other thing is I mentioned Jeff Cummings and new statistics and how it's actually very, very old statistics, but even his new statistics work is from 2011, I think is when his book and paper came out and just point towards that and say, look, this is not new stuff. The, the, the buy-in, uh, uh, Davidson and Bates paper and the Jaeger paper from 2008. That's 13 years now, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, that's all the advice I have is just try to demonstrate why. Show, show, that, show your goals and show how your methods meet your goals. Um, how can we train new scientists to embrace uncertainty and the main rewards uh, hinge upon it? Um, so, I think the hard thing is that we, we, we naturally want to know definite things. Like we want to say, this, this is definitely the case. Um, but the, the notion of uncertainty is, um, hmm, is, is really present in our daily lives in a way that we often kind of brush aside. And I think one of the things that I have often tried to do is um, bring up things about uh, how even quantities we take that are to be fixed are actually uncertain. So um, as a very coarse example, sorry, not great at thinking about this on the fly, 
is my height. Um, most humans have heights that vary throughout the day because as you stand up, your vertebra compress. And then on top of that, you have measurement error and all of these things. And so even though like I state my height as a meter 80, um, that's actually an uncertain number, right? It's a fuzzy number. Um, and so things like this. And then bringing that forward as well, right? Plotting the distributions, that's the other thing. And so I plotted these distributions quite intentionally is plot your data, see the variability, um, and really just show that there's this variability inherent into it and that that is just part of life. Um, oh boy. Um, so the next question is, do you think underpowered studies are so useful they're just adding to the pile of trash? They're useful in showing what not to do. Um, so the reason I say this is, um, if you look at underpowered studies, if you look at uh, Gelman and Carlin are the ones that have the type S and type M paper, um, they really, that paper for me made everything so clear about the problems. Like it, it really said, oh, that's not helping. And that also explains why um, certain effects are not consistent. So one of the things that people complain about is uh, things are not consistent. Uh, for example, in language processing, if you look at the literature from about 10 to 15 years ago on effects in the gamma band, they are all over the place. They are paradoxical, they disagree, even from the same author. And my guess is that those studies were underpowered. And I have a more precise reason why I think they were underpowered beyond just, we often don't have enough power, but rather the gamma band in EEG is particularly susceptible to environmental and uh, environmental noise and also noise from other things that are not brain-based. And so that's why we, we have reason to believe that measure is noisy and then all the results disagree. And so I think in a sense, publishing more stuff there is not helpful because it's not helping guide us. And one of the complaints that you see is that people, more, more is being published more and more, right? <laughs> more people are publishing more things. And I think from that perspective, adding to the noise is not really useful because um, it, is, it is hard to keep up. I'll, I'll readily admit that. Um, like it's hard to read all the other literature. And so I think, something like that. Um, there are people who are critical of slow science, but I think there's a difference between slow science and just making sure you're adequately powered. So um, I mentioned, by the way, one last thing and I'll move on to the next question. Paul Meal uh, has a great thing why he's against case studies. And I mentioned Paul Meal and his philosophy of science on, uh, in the talk. Um, and he actually mentions very particular conditions under which he would find case studies useful. And I think that's a good thing to think about, um, so. Um, uh, dissociation, double dissociation are so traditional two by two designs of mixed models. So reasons why I think mixed models are great. Um, I'm just going to name a few. Uh, one, you can do subjects and items at the same time. You can also do other blocking factors. You can have more complicated designs. Um, you get estimates for the between participant variability, for the within participant variability. You get individual level predictions that you can see, so these conditional modes or blups. Um, so you get all of these things basically for free by using mixed models, and you get explicit population-based estimates. And as a final thing, this goes back to all these procedures are models. With a mixed model, you can plot fitted values versus the observed values, and you can see how well your model is describing reality. And that is very helpful. There is a model behind ANOVA, which you could in theory do this, but I don't think most people know what that model is nor how you would plot the fitted versus observed values for that. Um, so uh, if you have a small logistical budget, should we not do a statistical test on small data sets? Um, you can do tests, but they might not be informative. Um, so this is also where if you have a very small budget, this is uh, think base a little bit, right? You have priors, and you have this, and there's all sorts of questions about how you would manage this and all these things, but you can use it to get estimates and you can show, okay, this is what I thought beforehand. I have collected a small amount of data. This is how my beliefs have updated. But it's also very, very important that you make clear, I've collected a small amount of data, so I can't really strongly change my mind. And I think this also ties into something that uh, uh, the students in the advanced frequencies course heard this week, is when you collect data, you're collecting information, ideally. <laughs> and data gives you an information budget. Um, and you have to be honest with yourself about what your information budget is. So your logistical budget starts off, but then that gives you an information budget. 
And the, the honesty and the hard part is saying, based on the information I have, this is how certain I can be in my decisions or uncertain. And I think that is very hard to do. And I don't think for accepting what your information budget is doesn't change based on whether you have a very small one or a very big one. It's all about really thinking hard about what that means. Great. So I think we managed to get through all the questions today. I actually answered some of your questions myself. Thank you. <laughs> I just took the liberty to do that. But thank you so much, uh, Philip. Oh, there's one more come up. I uh, will take this one as the last one. So and then we can stop. Right. So there's, there's one question more. Philip. Okay, uh, let me open that one again. Uh, approximation. Oh, different approximations. Um, so this gets into, so the question is uh, approximation, why p value is calculated using different approximations, one better than the other. So this depends on the context you're getting into. So um, there is, your p value is uniquely defined by your probability model, but there's all sorts of things you can do to tweak which probability model you're using. Um, but this also ties into the other point that I made about, and, and you mentioned this approximation, is direct versus iterative methods. So for, I mentioned at the very beginning this notion of test statistics and how we have reference distributions. It turns out we know the reference distributions for these very classical, very simple tests um, under ideal asymptotic assumptions. Um, we actually don't know what they are for a lot of things. So. Um, uh, Doug Bates has commented on this in an public forum before. Um, ben Bolker on the mixed models mailing list, this comes up a lot, um, is that, for example, for the mixed effect model, uh, we call this, this, this ratio uh, estimate divided by error the t-value, and is indeed a t-value in the sense of that. We don't know whether it actually follows the t-distribution. Um, and the answer is it does, realistically, because we have all these other guarantees. But for small sample sizes, you don't necessarily have that. And this is where you're probably getting at with the Satterwaite versus the Kenwood Roger degrees of freedom and all of this. And it's because there is no exact, and in that particular case, that's because there's no exact precise answer for why um, or what the degrees of freedom are. Um, to hear all about that, uh, you should have come to this week's advanced frequentist course, um, <laughs> maybe next year. Um, but the, the, the part of that is that degrees of freedom for more complicated models are harder than just the number of participants minus one. And I think that's, that's something that's a little bit harder to explain. Okay, so thank you so much, Philip. It's been a really great talk. There've been a, there've been a huge number of comments in the chat saying that they appreciate your talk very much and they enjoyed uh, you know, your in, learning, learning about your insights and all your ideas. So I want to thank you on their behalf as well. There are too many people to name here, just so many responses. So thanks a lot. You're and, welcome. Uh, yes, and I hope to see you someday again. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everybody.